the thing that really pushed me over the edge was redefining success. Because a lot of people, when I said, I'm going to leave and do this, they were like, oh, are you going to try to make it? You're going to try to make it as a comedian or as whatever? And I was like, not really, because I don't believe in that. Mm. What happens when you make it? What do you what do you get up and do the next day? Totally. You're just done? Like, I will never be satisfied by that. But I wanted to know what it would feel like. The thing that I compare it to is going on a hike. No one is like, hey, was that a successful hike? You're like, how was it? Was it hard? What did you see? How was the weather? And so once I changed my perspective from I need to leave and crush yeah, yeah. it. Get to the top versus the journey that you enjoy along the way. Yeah. I just wanted to know what this would feel like. That was a year and a half ago. I love it. I still love it. I want to keep doing it. But if a year from now, you and I are having dinner because I'm like, Logan, I'm ready to go back to tech. Fire up. <laughs> yeah. Fire up the port coast. Yeah, Who wants yeah, me? yeah, exactly. Like, that would be a great outcome. How cool would that be? Yeah, and totally. I go back. I've learned so much. Well, and, and it's, yeah, it, it's a two-way door, right? Jeff Bezos often talks about like decisions that can be undone versus mm, the ones that can't be undone. Yeah. And like this is, you can enjoy the journey along yeah. the way and then go back. Like uh, there will be even more people that want to hire mm, you mm -hmm. than before, right? Mm. Because now you have this experience and you have a yeah. breadth of resume and you could go do mm -hmm. the community job at Patreon that you once did or incorporate all these things that you've learned along the way to yeah. help companies out. What we haven't mentioned is, is freedom of speech, which is also kind of a fascinating one. But where there's this particular thing that sort of drives me crazy is, is Americans who are under the impression that freedom of speech is invented in the American Constitution and defined by it. And the only way, the only answer to any question is, well, this is what the Constitution says, as though, like, as though there's no other kinds of speech and no other ways it can be constrained and no other countries who might have their own opinions about this. Yeah. In, in a world in which, like, 95% of people on the internet are not in America. The literal interpretation of the Constitution is something that I, I'm sure this is blasphemous to say to 50 percent of America. But the literal interpretation of that as the standard by which international private companies should govern is just like a pretty it's it's a very myopic American worldview about like mm. how things are, are done in general. But it, it, it is a fascinating um, tension to see it playing out on the world stage with all of this stuff that I, I assume the instant state of all this is going to be more regulation for crypto, more regulation mm. for uh, Elon, more regulation for, uh, you know, retail investors protecting themselves against uh, some of these things. But it's interesting to see people try to push for like margin trading for retail investors, right? And it's like, gosh, I feel like we've seen this movie and it didn't end particularly well for the people involved. And so I, yeah. I, I just think this populist sentiment uh, is when it ultimately turns Turns as the public market has, I don't think it ends well for the people that have lots of money today and have done well surviving in the existing construct, right? This is the kind of the thing he's, the, you know, the, the, the thing he dances with is like he's daring them to fight, he's daring them to do something because if they do something that would actually be against, ultimately also be against their remit. I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's a generalized Elon securities law, like what happens next and there's a whole thing and so on. Um, I think there's a more specific Twitter thing, which is, you know, there's a break clause and he'd have to pay a billion dollars or whatever it is or get sued for more versus, um, you know, he could get it for 20 billion less for the sake of argument. So, you know, that's how real estate developers work. You know, that's how, you know, you go and you retrade it. And I, in a sense, I don't have a huge amount of sympathy for, you know, Twitter's board, like they're adults and they've run this thing for 10 years. And the person I have least sympathy for at all is, is Jack, who seems to have no awareness at all that he was actually the CEO of that company. I think he's forgotten. Along. Like it's it's funny how he's he's both been Parag's biggest advocate and Elon's biggest advocate at the same time, and he's both the CEO that resided over the banning of Trump, but also thinks he should be back on the platform because you know that was a business decision or something. He he does have a unique ability to talk out of both sides of his mouth on this. Yeah, it's like the you know when he finds out who was chief executive Twitter, he's going to be really surprised. He, the next time he walks past a mirror, he's going to be very shocked to find out what's what's there. In 2017, while I was working at Twilio, I had moved from New York to San Francisco, New York, which has different career paths and different types of people yes. and different things. And I moved to San Francisco, which has one thing, and it is tech. Yep. And I worked at a tech company and all my friends worked in tech. The person I was dating worked in tech. Everything I did all the time was tech. I and make it, a joke, by the way, uh, of like New York 
famous people walk into a bar and it's like Derek Jeter yeah. or like Lauren Michaels yeah. or whatever, yeah. right? Michael Bloomberg. And in uh, San Francisco, like famous person walks into the bar and it's like Reed Hoffman or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like nothing against Reed. He seems yeah, like a great guy. No, yeah, but like, that is so funny. He's not like a celebrity. It's so true. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that sort of like one note vibe was something that started to feel kind of overwhelming, yeah. especially because I had come from New York, which had felt so rich culturally. First point is like Twitter has always been known as this place where good people would go and they would fail to get anything done and they would leave and they would get something done. So somebody I knew worked there um, and he had a child that his, he and his wife had a baby and he left and he had twins. And I said, Kevin, you doubled your productivity. Uh, which is kind of the, the like the archetype of the Twitter experience. And you hear all these like amazing stories of what a shambles it was sort of 15 years ago and 10 years ago. And you hear those stories, but I also sort of hear those stories like now of what a mess it is. Now, you could argue like, is the contrast with Instagram? So there's, so let me wind back, like there's always been this kind of problem and it's actually really hard to define what it is, what the new experience should be. You have to spend months working on it in order to build value and build a followers. You join, you've got an empty screen, you tweet, no one sees it, you're shouting it to the void. Yep. It's a really hard experience relative to something like Instagram. And you could argue, is the reason it's such a mess because it's so hard? Or does it just look hard because it's such a mess? Girls yeah. are probably both. TikTok has figured this out in an onboarding funnel way yeah. where, you know, it is an interest graph as well, but they figured out that funnel in a much more meaningful way. But it's easier. It's an, a much easier kind of content to look at. It's easier to look at videos and pictures than to scan a bunch of people's tweets and work out whether you would want to follow them. It's just, there is this kind of chicken and egg. Is, does it look so hard because the company's never really been any good at working it out? Or vice versa. And I think the answer is probably a bit of both. Yeah. The long time ago, I actually was an equity analyst, which is that Elon doesn't act like a public company CEO, yes. doesn't really care what the rules are. Um, and Mason gets away with it. And you could argue like the whole funding secured thing in the end, the price went up so much afterwards that the shareholders didn't really suffer for that. But there's kind of reasons why you're not supposed to just fuck with people. Yeah. And you're not supposed to fuck with the shareholders and you're not supposed to lie. Those rules are kind of there for a reason. Um, and it's kind of not okay to just pick and choose which ones you feel like obeying and, you know, and mess about, mess around with it. So I think that's, you know, that's kind of a, a, maybe a political opinion. No, no, I mean, I, Matt Levine had a really but good like, thing this week about like, you know, calling it what it was. He's like, Musk is lying about this stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, it's very kind of Trumpian in a sense in that he's just ignoring what the norms are and daring the regulator to do something about it and kind of dancing all over the edge of the line between, you know, what you're not supposed to do an actual securities fraud or whatever you want to call it. And that's nothing to do with tech or test or, or Twitter. It's just, you know, how he, how he, how he's behaved and a bunch of other issues here. I mean, I had a, a tweet about it where I said, you know, basically the problem with Elon is he's a bullshitter who delivers. So if he says all this stuff and he does all this stuff and there's a self-landing rocket ship and there's a scale first scale yeah, kind of company yeah, yeah. since the second world war. It's not MLM um, <laughs> or it's not a Ponzi scheme. If you actually make good on what you promised. Or, or, right? Well, except that half of it is the other half doesn't turn up. Yeah, exactly. You know, we're still waiting for the self-driving girl. The U S tends to have a model of regulation by litigation and by crime. Did you break Sherman antitrust act? Yes or no. And this is what we saw in the Apple Epic lawsuit. Like, did they break this law? Yes or no. Um, whereas um, the UK and Europe have a model of a regulator that can write laws. So the regulator can say, do we think this market's anti-competitive? Do we dislike the market structures is bad for consumers? Yes. And therefore, we will just change stuff. So, you know, the EU will, you know, the EU is passing a law at the moment called the, the um, Digital Markets Act, which will basically require everything from, this is, a, this is an argument about how broad it is, but they will just require Apple to open up the app store. And that, it's not because Apple will go to court and lose a court case. They'll just pass a new, they'll just create a new set of regulations and say, no, 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 that we're just going to change how that market works. Whereas in the US, what you, what you have at the moment is this law that, that Ted Cruz and somebody has introduced yesterday, of like, we're going to ban any company from having more than $20 billion of advertising in the US, like something, I forget what the details are. You get these sort of press release laws that are really hard to, it's hard to understand how much attention you should pay to it because it's most of them never happened. Whereas in Europe, there's a, this giant law that takes five years and then rather like GDPR, it just lands and they're like, oh shit, <laughs> it's real, it's here.